Welcome back to History of the Ancient Near East. I'm your instructor, Justin Singleton. Now, in this lecture, we are going to begin our study of individual time by discussing Abraham, father of the Israelite nation. Now, in this discussion, we will emphasize the historical context of the patriarch, establishing a date range for Abraham, specifically whether he dates to Middle Bronze II or earlier at Early Bronze IV. Um, we will then move on to the travels of Abraham and company, discussing their move from Ur to Haran, and then finally in Canaan. And lastly, we will discuss the faith of Abraham in historic context, paying special attention to the worship of El, that's E-L, during the period, questioning whether El and Yahweh are the same or at least similar deities, and in the end discussing how Abraham was called to correct an ancient faith. Now, having worked through both the geographical and social time aspects of the ancient Near East, this study moves now into individual or punctular time. Now, where geographical time deals with the very slow-changing geological and geographical aspects in history, um, including mountains, rivers, seas, metals, and the like, and where social time deals with the somewhat slow-changing social aspects of history, including generations of differing people groups, empires, political relationships, types and uses of tools or objects, and the lasting effects of key individuals, punctular time deals with the faster-changing aspects of history, including those related to individuals, wars, battles, treaties, and more. Punctular time is that piece of the Brodellian puzzle that most people refer to when they speak of history. You know, the, uh, the names and dates. Now, important punctular events in modern history may include 1492, 1776, 1914, 1949, and 2001. Avoiding numbers, one may speak of Christopher Columbus, America's Declaration of Independence and the war that followed, World War I, the founding of Communist China, or the attacks that started the War on Terror. These events are punctular or individual time aspects in the Braudelian method. As this study involves ancient history, uh, specifically the ancient history of the Near East, key moments will be expounded upon differentiated by way of geographical location, namely Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Levant. As such, this portion of the study is devoted to key punctular events involving Mesopotamia, though it would be impossible to note every single punctular event. Key moments will be pulled out and investigated. Now, the purpose of this last section of the study is to show how geographical and social time help to interpret individual time. And as such, this study of punctular time begins with biblical Abraham. The biblical story of Abraham is well known worldwide. Abraham being the a uh, uh, progenitor of the three modern Hebraic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As the narrative informs, Abram was called by the one true God to leave his home, travel to a new place, and then sire a nation, his name being changed to Abraham along the way. Uh, the events of Abraham's career are recorded in Genesis 11, verse 27, through chapter 25, verse 11, which is the largest of the Toledot pericopes in Genesis, these being 12 literary sections of the book of Genesis, the last 11 of which begin with some form of the word Toledot, or generations, as the King James Version translates it, in a form such as, you know, these are the generations of blah, blah, blah. 
uh, including the Toledot of the heavens and the earth, Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem specifically, and then Abraham's portion as the Toledot of Terah, the father of Abraham. Now, the question that concerns this study is this. How does the story of Abraham fit into the historical narrative? Now, in order to understand how Abraham fits into the historical na uh, narrative, one must first establish a date range for the person of Abraham. Now, much has been written on this topic. Two options will be summarized here, namely placing Abraham uh, in either the Middle Bronze Age or placing him in the Early Bronze Age. Though some fringe elements have adopted, or excuse me, attempted to date Abraham to the Neolithic or Chalcolithic, either by squeezing these periods down to around 1800 BC, or by placing Abraham around 5400 BC, uh, the Neolithic Chalcolithic option will not be entertained here. Concerning either the Middle or Early Bronze Age positions, much depends on both the length that Israel continued in Egypt, either a 215-year sojourn or one extending 430 years, and the date that, is, that one assumes of the Exodus. Now, as a length of time is counted backwards from a known point, those suggesting a 215-year sojourn argue for a Middle Bronze II, birth and life of Abraham while those suggesting a 430-year sojourn naturally argue for a period farther back in time, namely Early Bronze IV. Those who assume a 13th century exodus, that's, uh, you know, 1200s, um, those who assume that presume a 430-year sojourn, but that ends up placing Abraham in the Middle Bronze Age. So to summarize uh, just real quick, there are two basic positions. Either Abraham was born and lived in the Middle Bronze Age or the Early Bronze Age. Okay, we continue now, sorry. Middle Bronze II. Okay, several historical and archaeological evidences are offered in support of the Middle Bronze Age. One such evidence includes the price of slaves, particularly as that historical price relates to the monetary amount of Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was sold to passing Ishmaelites in Genesis thirty-seven twenty-eight, namely, twenty silver shekels. Now, within the Code of Hammurabi, uh, specifically in line two hundred fifty-two, and in documents from Mari, the standard price of a slave during the Middle Bronze II period was one third of a mina, which equals to about twenty silver shekels. Uh, interestingly, earlier during the Ur-3 period, or EB-4, the cost of a slave was around 10 shekels, and later in Assyria, the price reaches around 30 shekels of silver. Thus, based on the price of a slave only, Joseph would appear to have been sold during the Middle Bronze Age. Additionally, there are common features between early 2nd millennium treaties and the differing covenants found in Genesis. And many of the geopolitical conditions appear to have been, uh, you know, uh, the same during the Middle Bronze II period. Also of note, some arguments against an Early Bronze IV date include the so-called uh, "quote-unquote" impossibilities of the long lifespans of the patriarchs, the inconsistent generations assigned to Moses and then Joshua within a biblical text, and the so-called lack of archaeological evidences around 1400 BC for the biblical conquest. This last so-called evidence then argues for a 1200 BC conquest. Uh, interestingly, the final argument given a couple moments ago that Abraham must have had his career during Middle Bronze II because the conquest occurred during the 1200s uh, that's actually evidence that I use personally to place Abraham in early Bronze IV, namely because the date of 1446 B.C. for the Exodus and 1406 B.C. for the Conquest are such firmly established dates. 
from these dates and using Exodus 12, 40 through 41 and Galatians 3, 17, a date 430 years before the Exodus is established as a time that the children of Israel went down into Egypt, a date of 1876 BC, which is indeed during the Middle Bronze II period, but stands as an event outside of the life of Abraham. Now, some argue that Galatians 3, 17 through 18, which makes reference to the Abrahamic covenant, extends the sojourn not from the time of Jacob and his family entering Egypt, but from the co- um, excuse me, but from the covenant made to Abraham, and must hence begin when Abraham entered Egypt. Now this is problematic, as Acts uh, chapter seven verses six through seven, um, uh, excuse me, which lists the amount of time passes four hundred years, specifically discusses maltreatment and enslavement of the Israelites, events that did not occur during Abraham's stay in Egypt. Now, assuming this long chronology, the birth of Abraham could be dated following the standard date of around 2170 BC, give or take a few. This would place Abraham's first year in Canaan around 2095 BC, which is either during the first intermediate period of Egypt or shortly thereafter, and therefore a date during early Bronze IV in the southern Levant. Now, of course, Abraham uh, uh, didn't just appear in Canaan. He began in Ur of Mesopotamia, a city of great importance to the region both before and during Abraham's life. Now, having established a birth year for Abraham around 2170 BC, um, the patriarch appears to have been born during the Semitic Akkadian Empire, which ended around... 2150 BC. Now, to what extent the family of Abraham was involved in a Semitic government, or even if at all, is completely unknown and will likely remain that way. But the very concept of internal conflict in the Akkadian Empire necessarily means strife, particularly as the drying phase continued to cause problems in the region, even after Abraham had arrived in Canaan. Now, this is not to say that the collapsing Akkadian Empire was fraught with anti-Semitism uh, or you know anything like that. In fact, statues of, of Sargonic kings were still being honored after the collapse. Okay, now discussing Abraham's travels from Ur, uh, having established a date for Abraham concurrent with the Ur-3 period, which dates from around 2112 to 2004 BC, Abraham was living in the post-Akkadian capital of the region. Shortly after the defeat of the Gutians at the hands of Uduhagal of Uruk, who established a rather short-lived power dating around 2120 to 2112, Ur-Namu, king of Ur, took power of the region, establishing the Ur-3 empire. Now, being 75 years old when he left Haran for Canaan, Abraham left Ur around 70 years old, and therefore just as the region began to stabilize around 2100 BC, likely during the reign of Ernamu. Uh, Now, discussing Abraham's move to Haran, the settlement of Haran is located in modern northern Syria which was a part of northern Mesopotamia, and is the geographical region of the Arameans, a people group of whom Abraham belonged, according to Deuteronomy 26.5. The site was known as an important layover on the road between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Archaeologically, there is little to know from Haran during the Patriarchal Age, but there is uh, inscriptional evidence of a temple dedicated to the Mesopotamian moon deity Sen, dating back to the early parts of the second millennium. Of particular interest, Ernamu, the founder of the Ur-3 empire and king of Ur during the uh, the, uh, uh, later period of Abraham's life there, 
um, Ernamu built the ziggurat of Ur, dedicated to the same moon god, Sin. As a matter of fact, the city of Ur was the center of worship for the moon god. The connection is furthered by the possible interrelation between Terra, the father of Abraham, and the deity Sin, specifically the linguistic relationship between the family names Sarah, Milka, Laban, and possibly even Terra himself, with a lunar deity. Uh, forgive me, I kind of got lost in what I was doing there. So there's a possible linguistic connection between Terra, Sarah, Milka, and Laban uh, with the lunar deity Sin. By way of example, the name Sarah uh, relates to the Babylonian Sharatu, meaning wife of Sin. The name Laban is the word for white, like the moon. So there's a possible linguistic connection between some of Abraham's family and the moon god. Now, the biblical narrative does not explain why Abraham stopped at Haran, and even if the stop was somehow a wrong move. I've heard a lot of sermons where people say, you know, he shouldn't have done it. Uh, the biblical text doesn't explain whether it was bad or not. But several theories have arisen, namely that Terah became sick, as evidenced by his death at the site. Um, they may have stopped because there was good pasture, uh, as evidenced by the climate of the region. And the religious consistencies between Ur and Haran. Now, whatever the reason, Abraham did leave and continued his journey on to Canaan. Now, at Canaan, um, nothing is said of the journey to Canaan. But the story picks up upon reaching the land, specifically Shechem. At Shechem, Abraham hears the voice of Yahweh once again, and he builds an altar to his God, which may have also acted as a type of land claim stake, uh, as is seen elsewhere within Scripture. Key to the story of Abraham is the time period in which Abraham entered the land. Now, whereas EB3 contained fortified and even a few highly fortified cities, Early Bronze IV in the southern Levant was a deflated period, and the land was scarcely populated. You know, some walled cities did remain in the Levant during EB4, such as Kirbet el Mayeta, but walled cities were primarily found in the north. The majority of Levantine inhabitants lived as mobile pastoralists and village dwellers, living in either small undefended villages or transitory encampments, establishing new sites at locations different than EB3 settlements. Now, the pastoralist lifestyle of the southern Levant during the time of Abraham was connected to the second Eblite kingdom in the northern Levant, which had a a strong wool economy, if you remember from previous lectures. Now, it's possible that the northern wool economy made a decisive impact on the south's shift toward pastoralism in these early stages of EB4, but the southern culture was never truly integrated into northern society. Um, instead, it, it continued as a semi-pastoral society. Now, this was a shift in both the, the social order and the subsistence economy of the land uh, that might be called a dark age. Except for only a few sites, most EB-4 settlements are established at new locations, though the Transjordan region shows a little more continuity. Thus, Abraham entered into Canaan at a seemingly perfect time. The pastoral lifestyle of Abraham and his family match the lifestyle of many of the southern Levantine inhabitants. And Abraham likely participated in trade with northern Levantine merchants, or you know, other pastoralists selling their flocks to the Eblites um, and other you know, northern Levantine cities. The Eblites specifically reestablishing themselves after the destruction of the city sometime before Abraham. Now, if Abraham had lived and entered during EB-3 he would have been met with a great deal of conflict, particularly by the warring fortified cities. Now, if he had entered during Middle Bronze 2a, the second Eblite kingdom and its wool economy would not exist. 
and Abraham would have faced the ever-growing second urbanization of the region. In my notes, I kind of feel like I um, left that there for a moment, so let me just uh, uh, note, just ignore the screen for a moment. Just note, uh, God designed everything, right? He, he designed uh, when Abraham was called, when Abraham was born. When, he designed it all. And so you can see God's perfect plan for Abraham. Again, EB3, fortified cities everywhere. Abraham probably would have been killed. Middle Bronze 2A, the northern wool economy is gone. So what's Abraham doing with all of his sheep? And he would be messing with the, you know, the second urbanization of, of, of the land. So all of this goes back down to God's perfect timing. Okay, sorry, forgive me for that little rabbit trail. Moving on to discuss Abraham's faith. Now, there is some dispute as to whether Abraham served Yahweh before God had called him. And Joshua 24, 2 may or may not reveal that Abraham was included in those who were you know, polytheistic. Uh, but worship of Yahweh, uh, specifically, dates to the time of Enosh, son of Seth, son of Adam, as evidenced in Genesis 4, 26, as we see here. There was also born a son of Seth, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on Yahweh's name. Now, whether Abraham was himself a polytheist is really not important to the narrative. What is important to the narrative is the acceptance of the deity who had called him. Now, the land to which Abraham had arrived was a land centered on the worship of the Semitic deity El. In Ugaritic texts, El is the chief god who is described as an aged, wise, and kindly creator god. He's the creator of all things, including all other deities and humanity. And he stands apart from other deities in that El has no nature-centered symbolism. He's not a storm god, he's not a sea god, he's not the god of death, or the god of uh, uh, poison ivy, or whatever you want to call it. There's no nature-centered symbolism. You know, the closest nature-centered symbolism for El might be the image of a bull, uh, but that was just an an idea of strength, or maybe you can say that where he lived at the mouth of the river, uh, as per the Baal cycle, but it just doesn't really work out. He's just simply the creator God. Thus, El is a very different kind of God. Uh, just take another little uh, step back here for a moment. If you think about it, um, who are some other deities that you know of from history? You've got you know, Marduk. Well, Marduk was not the first god. There was another god before him. There was another god before him. The thing is Zeus. You know, Zeus wasn't the creator of all things. He came from the Titans, and the Titans came from other gods. You know, this El person, you know, he's, he's the big guy. He's the one who created everything. All right. Moving forward again, El, as a deity, appears to be an original Semitic god, as per early textual evidence, appearing in the earliest Old Akkadian text without case ending as use of the divine name. At Rashamra, Ugarit, there's clear evidence for the term El being used not as a general conception, like not a lowercase g, but as the name of a specific deity, like an uppercase G. Thus, originally, L appears to have been a proper noun, a name, that eventually became a common noun, and not the other way around, as many have argued. Now, of particular interest to the subject at hand is that in Genesis 14.22, after Melchizedek offers a blessing upon Abraham by the name of El Most High, Abraham responds by raising his hand in a vow to Yahweh, 
El Most High, creator of heaven and earth, equating El of the local population with Yahweh in the biblical text. Now, interestingly, the phrase in Genesis 14.22 describing Yahweh is uh, quite reminiscent of one used in the Phoenician inscription of Azitawad, which describes El as the creator of all things, you know, the creator of heaven and earth here. Now, in these early years of Hebraic tradition, the deity El, who was worshipped by Semites in the land of Canaan, and likely, in fact, worshipped since the days of Shem, appears to have been the one true God from whom Abraham received a calling and promise, particularly as seen in the Melchizedek passage. Now, of note, in addition to worshipping with Canaanites, yes, you heard that correctly, Abraham went and he worshipped with Canaanites, uh, Abraham, you know, as we just saw with Melchizedek, Abraham also makes deals with Canaanites. He fights alongside Canaanites and overall has a positive view of his ethnic neighbors. After the patriarchal period, you know, after uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth, uh, this view became diminished, no doubt linked to the importation of Baalism into Canaan at the end of the 19th century BC. Much later, at the time of Asaph, who penned Psalm 82, El had become differentiated from Yahweh altogether. Now, whether or not Abraham worshipped El, the Canaanite god, is not in question. What's important to note is that El, the Canaanite god, was worshipped in Canaan at the time that Abraham entered the land. Abraham even using the language of El in his own worship. Now, this does not mean that Abraham was worshiping foreign gods. Um, it's particularly obvious that Abraham worshipped Yahweh. In my opinion, El was not, uh, excuse me, was likely not an early Semitic god, but the earliest Semitic god, the god of Shem, the god of Noah. Now, this helps to explain the Canaanite dichotomy before and after the Egyptian sojourn. Abraham was with relatives, fellow Semites. Abraham was called by the God of the Semites. From future biblical texts, it's clear that the purpose of this calling was to bring you know, about a more pure form of worship, culminating in the person of Jesus in the New Testament. Now, the, the clash with the Canaanites, you know, Joshua go and kill them all, drive them out, right? The class with the Canaanites comes only after Egypt, and for a very specific reason that includes their religious change from El worship to that of Baal, a completely different god. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. As always, feel free to contact me if you need anything or if you want to chat about, about this topic farther.